section is called The Enemies Within uh, the Secret State and the Miners. And I'm really incredibly pleased to have Seamus Milne here, who did the seminal book, The Enemy Within the Secret War Against the Miners, the book which is now relaunching this year. I think there can't be a more appropriate time to revisit those arguments when you're starting to hear the same things, the same smear campaigns against the NUM, the same, uh, when, when there's even more revelations coming out about just how far the police will go in terms of their attacks on campaigns and ordinary people. I think the day after, the couple of days after you find out that the police, even up to a few years ago, were still spying on the Lawrence campaign, I think the lessons can be learned very clearly from what happened in the minor strike. So, Seamus is going to talk for 15 minutes. I'm also incredibly pleased to have Penny Green here, who's the Professor of Criminology at the State Crimes Initiative, who also published a book called The Enemy Without, and actually was in Nottingham for the whole period of the strike. And I think they're going to... Okay, five minutes. <laughs> um, I'll, start with, uh, I'll start with Penny, who's going to talk for about ten minutes, and then go to Seamus. Sinead and, and Mike have achieved and it's wonderful to see the, the, the strike commemorated in this fashion. You know, I teach uh, criminology students and, and so many of them know nothing at all about the, the strike and I see it as part of my role as um, educating them about um, the history of, of class struggle in this country. Um, yes, um, Seamus's book, The Enemy Within, my book was the basis of my PhD um, and it was called The Enemy Without. And this is not a plug because you can't buy it. <laughs> um, it's, it's out of print. I think it costs about £240 for me, but I mean on Amazon. Um, but just very briefly, I, Mike asked me if I'd comment a little bit on, on my reflections of doing field work um, uh, during the miners' strike um, as a, a, a criminologist and as a, as a PhD student at the time. I think the miners' strike exploded the idea of police neutrality and liberal democracy for many people uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it was a policing project designed to criminalise striking miners and to effectively uh, defeat the miners' strike itself. For those who understand the history of the police in Britain, their primary role is essentially in controlling working class dissent. Uh, what we witnessed during the strike uh, was not altogether surprising. But for most people, and this was certainly true for many in the mining communities, and particularly in Nottinghamshire where I was based, uh, that the policing of the strike was something truly shocking. Something which changed their ideas about the state and the nature of the state. Uh, they saw it then as politically directed, brutally partisan, um, and I think policing in the Nottinghamshire coalfield was as far from the, the notion of the thin blue line as was possible in this country. It was clear from the very beginning that the role of the police was to defeat the strike and to service the interests of the Thatcher Tory government and the National Coal Board. Now, um, I went up to... Um, Nottinghamshire, um, in fact I started my PhD at Cambridge on the, um, the, the massacres of communists in Indonesia in the 1960s and I started that in October 1983 and then um, in February the miners strike kicked off and I had to leave the communists of Indonesia uh, and devote myself to understanding what was going on in the miners strike. And so my PhD changed completely. Uh, I went to Nottinghamshire partly because um, Mike Simons had introduced me to uh, strikers uh, in the village of Ollerton, and they made me extremely welcome and I was able to conduct my field work there. I stayed five months in what was to be a very bitterly divided community. Initially, uh, about 50% of Ollerton, not strikers generally, I think, uh, came out on strike. The Yorkshire pickets were successful in bringing many Nottinghamshire miners um, out on the picket lines. Um, but that dissipated fairly quickly, and it was a, a, 
of the remaining 20% of um, striking Nottinghamshire miners lasted throughout that strike. I spent those five months in Ollerton interviewing striking miners, uh, the women who were involved in women against pit closures and who were working in the soup kitchens, standing on picket lines um, with the men of their villages. And I also interviewed some working miners and TU, um, trade union officials. I was particularly interested in the impact of the policing experience on the class consciousness of those um, miners who were at the, um, the, the harshest end of that policing. And I think one of the most outstanding features of the strike was to witness the coordinated brutality of its policing. I mean, there was a real coincidence of interest between the police, the government, the National Coal Board, the law, and the courts. And I think that this coordinated uh, campaign against the strikers uh, illustrated just how significant uh, a win by those miners would have been to the Tory government. Um, I think from any perspective, Nottinghamshire was, was a flashpoint because it was so bitterly divided. The stakes were so much higher here. If the government could keep the Nottinghamshire pits working, it would keep the strike divided and therefore weakened and ultimately defeated. The I think, I, I can't actually remember the exact dates, but I know that very early on in the dispute, when the Yorkshire pickets were having some success in Nottinghamshire, Margaret Thatcher was said to have banged the table, the cabinet table, um, and, and um, attacked uh, the chief constables of, 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 of Britain. And Leon Britton, as Home Secretary, immediately authorised 3,000 police officers um, from 18 different police forces around the country to enter Nottinghamshire and to make sure that those who wanted to work could work and to make sure that flying pickets from Yorkshire and Kent were prevented from entering the county. That figure of 3,000 police officers was to increase, they, they said to further 8,000 in um, some weeks later. So it was a very, uh, for ordinary mining people in an ordinary mining community, the idea that you would have thousands of police officers in your small village actively working against your interests was something really very shocking for them. And I remember at one stage when I was in Ollerton, a village of some 10,000 people, there were 3,000 police officers in the village. And what those police officers were doing was intimidating striking the striking community. They had roadblocks on entrances to the, the village uh, at um, pit change time to ensure that um, no pickets could enter the village to, to talk to those who were working, to try and convince them to join the strike. The police were also there to make sure that those Nottinghamshire miners who were on strike were kept as far away as possible from working miners. So at the pit head gates, when there was a shift change taking place, um, there would be hundreds of police at the entrance. The Those who wanted to picket, at the time the employment laws uh, limited the number of official pickets to six. Um, the police in Nottinghamshire would allow one or two to be at the pit head gates. Everybody else was deemed a demonstrator and they were pushed into the car park of the Plough pub, which was across the road and away a little bit, for those of you who know Ollerton. Uh, and so the demonstrators were, were very far away from those people they were trying to convince to join them in the strike. Um, and they were largely they were unable to even see those people who were um, going into work, let alone actually being able to speak to them. So the police presented a physical and, and, and visual barrier um, so that working miners didn't experience the, the kind of arguments really that, that were um, that, that the striking miners wanted to engage in in order to persuade them to join the strike. Um, so there was a massive penetration of uh, police 
into mining communities in Nottinghamshire. And I think it's true to say, my, I certainly witnessed the fact that the police uh, were as much focusing on the village and village life as they were at the pit head gate. They conducted a campaign of intimidation against uh, ordinary Ollerton villagers. Um, I, I remember interviewing people who had tried to leave the village uh, at, at particular points to attend physiotherapy sessions at a local hospital. Um, the police, in fact, I remember interviewing one man in particular who had one leg um, and his other leg wasn't very fit uh, from his perspective and he was told by the police that the only way he could get to the hospital was to walk. Um, and uh, so he had to leave his car and he did, he, did. He, he somehow struggled to the hospital um, and was um, and made it to his physiotherapy appointment, but you know the police had absolutely no regard for the rights of ordinary citizens in, in Ollerton at that time. I think it's important to remember that the policing uh, was coordinated very centrally, and this was something relatively new for Britain, uh, by the National Reporting Centre, uh, in, based in New Scotland Yard in London. And at the National Reporting Centre, they monitored the movement of flying pickets, and they ensured that the police were there to prevent them um, entering the county. Um, I think during March there was an average daily deployment of what they called police support units uh, into Nottinghamshire and the police support, support units were like minivans carrying around 23 police officers at a time. Uh, I think the average daily deployment was 150 of these PSUs. So you can imagine that the, the, these villages were characterised um, by this astonishing policing presence and in a sense in which the police were there not in any way to defend the rights of ordinary people or to prevent crime. Um, not that, that, that is their role anyway. Um, but that they were there with a very specific political purpose. And I think there were at least 3,500 police uh, deployed into the county each day. Um, I think the experience that I witnessed was one of um, excessive violence directed towards both strikers uh, and, um, and villagers. Uh, people were constantly provoked. We all know the stories of um, police officers waving wadges of cash um, in front of, of striking miners who were suffering the kind of poverty that we heard about in this morning's session. They also enga engaged in paramilitary style surges. They had learned the lessons from Northern Ireland and from my history of colonial policing. So the policing was of a particularly violent kind during the miners' strike. There were mass arrests and these arrests were designed to take militants out of the front line. We saw the, um, and in fact, those arrests uh, combined with the bail conditions, which the courts were very ready, readily um, handing out, uh, were designed again to keep um, minors away from the picket lines. You would find that the charges initially would be um, uh, assaulting a police officer, a very serious charge, a very serious criminal charge. We would find very quickly that those charges, once the miners were in the police station, would be reduced to obstructing a police officer in the, in the line of, of duty. Uh, obviously a charge much easier um, to provide evidence for than an assault. Um, but in fact the charges didn't matter. What mattered were the bail conditions, and those conditions were to keep miners, I mean the bail conditions would mean that miners were not able to go anywhere near the pit head, were not able to go near the collieries uh, for the period of any shift change. Well, the police didn't have to justify their actions. It was enough for them to say, you're a striking minor, um, you haven't done what you were told, uh, and whether or not what you were told was justifiable. Um, by March, so very early um, into the strike, um, no, sorry, I'm sorry, by March 1985, a year, right towards the end of the strike, 11,312 miners had been arrested. I mean, that's a massive number of, 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 of people arrested in the course of that strike. I think 
the law uh, paid, um, or the law was incredibly important in sustaining the um, treatment uh, or the police treatment of the, of the miners. Um, <clears throat> both the criminal and the civil law, that the police constantly invoked employment law, which is civil law, um, to make criminal charges against miners, but the courts were prepared to uphold the police actions. Um, apart from granting these very restrictive, um, politically inspired bail conditions, the courts were also very willing to deny individual justice to picketing strikers. Um, rather, they were uh, prepared to attribute collective guilt so that minors' uh, individual cases were, were not heard in, in, in a traditional way in, in the courts. The strike, the, the law acted also um, 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 civilly. The strike in Yorkshire and North Derbyshire was ruled unlawful in the High Court. Um, and the defiance of this ruling brought fines of £1,000 to Arthur Scargill and £200,000 to um, the NUM. When Scargill and the NUM refused to pay, the High Court uh, then ordered the sequestration of NUM funds. And on the 30th of November 1984, the High Court replaced the NUM elected officials with a receiver. So I think my time is probably, um, and then, but I, I, I wanted to say that the policing of the strike was much more than simply the men in, 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 in uniform. The police was, stri the, the strike was policed um, by uniformed police, by the law, by the courts, by the National Coal Board, and to some extent by um, the welfare system. Um, and I'm sure some of the women who were involved in the um, pit um, closures, Women Against Pit Closures can talk more about that. But I think it was, uh, and I think in terms of the results of my research, um, many, many people um, had their heads turned in relation to the police. Now, I'm not sure for how long though their heads were turned. I mean, when life gets back to normal following a defeat, unless you continue to engage politically um, in order to survive, uh, you, you quickly return to some of the, the kind of the dominant ideas which you hold about the state. Um, but, but during the course of that strike, uh, many, many people, uh, not only in the mining communities, but throughout Britain, um, came to a new realisation about the real role of the police in Britain. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Sinead, and, and thanks to Penny for that um, very instructive uh, overview of policing during the, the strike. And I'm, it's really a privilege to be here at this fantastic event today to celebrate the minor strike and, and to build support for the film that Mike and Sinead have been... Uh, have been making um, and I'd really like to pay tribute to anyone here who was formerly uh, a minor involved in the strike or in the fantastic Women Against Pit Closures campaign uh, and activists who took part in the solidarity campaign with the strike uh, at that time because I think the, the story of the minor strike of 84-5 and of course it's not the only minor strike in post-war British history that was very important, but it was a, a, an absolutely crucial one, of course, isn't just about the past, it's also about the future. And I think it's for that reason that the strike has become overlayered with decades of mythology uh, and misrepresentation, uh, both in the media uh, and in politics, uh, ac almost across the board. Uh, the strike is portrayed as having been an act of folly and incompetence. Uh, and, uh, the NUM, an organisation of lions led by donkeys. The strike, an undemocratic and unwinnable uh, dispute. Now, of course, none of that is remotely true. And it's now even clearer uh, than it was at the time that this strike was not only an unparalleled confrontation that convulsed Britain and was a watershed in post-war history, 
that pitted the most powerful and politicized trade union against a right-wing Tory government that was bent on class revenge. But it's also clear that this was a battle to protect livelihoods and jobs that could not have been avoided and was conducted with, in fact, great ingenuity, courage and endurance at all levels uh, of the National Union of Mine Workers. And crucially, came far, far closer uh, than was understood at the time to winning and defeating the Tory government and breaking the Thatcher onslaught on organised labour and wider progressive politics uh, that was, undergo was going on at the time. And I think a generation on, it's clear, clearer than it was at the time, that this was a challenge to the destructive, profit-centred, market-orientated, corporate-led drive to transform economic life in the interests of the richest in the country. Uh, and that system that was built in that time, that model of economic and social life, of course, crashed in the crisis of 2008 that we're living with the aftermath of today. And it also at the same time raised the alternative of a different kind of Britain, one rooted in solidarity uh, and collective action against the greed and individualism of the Thatcher years. And it's for those reasons, particularly the strength and politicization of the union, and its pivotal role in energy supply at the time, that the state was mobilized in an unprecedented way. And in the 30 years since, we've had a stream of revelations that have con confirmed the scale of that mobilization at, and exactly what the miners' leaders, the miners and their supporters were saying at the time. I mean, only most recently, but this is just part of a, an avalanche of stuff, really. The cabinet papers that were released in January uh, about the 1984 period um, under the 30-year rule confirmed exactly what, of course, the NUM leadership and the NUM had been saying at the time of the 84-5 strike, that there was indeed a secret hit list to close Im Im immediately in the next couple of years uh, 70 coal mines uh, with 70,000 jobs, exactly what Scargill had said at the time and was ridiculed and abused for misleading his members. Uh, it's confirmed that the government lied and the coal board lied about that. Those papers confirmed that, they, that Thatcher planned and on several occasions to send in the army uh, to tr break the strike and to move coal supplies as they feared fuel was running out and even food, food supplies uh, were, were running out. The, the cabinet papers confirm how the government directly manipulated the press and were preparing conspiracy charges to bring against the miners' leadership. And that process of revelations and confirmation of what was suspected or alleged at the time has been going on um, since the strike. And it really has revealed the hidden underbelly of the wider state assault. Now, this book, The Enemy Within, which uh, um, Sinead very kindly mentioned, is republished this week in an updated form, a new edition. It's been in print for 20 years, and I thought it might be quite uh, instructive to tell you a little bit about how the book came to be written, uh, because uh, you need to go back to the early 1990s, in fact, 1990, uh, six years after the strike, five years after the end of the strike. And I mean, I'm sure many of you here will remember, there was at that time a campaign of allegations of corruption, a smear campaign that was launched against the leaders of the strike, Arthur Scargill, Peter Heathfield, Mick McGahey, that alleged that they had stolen money that was uh, donated by Libya uh, to pay off their mortgages or their home loans uh, and diverted more than a million pounds of donations to the strike uh, from the Soviet miners. This was a campaign which was run in the Daily Mirror, 
supposedly Labour supporting paper then owned by Robert Maxwell and the Cook Report was an incredibly popular uh, TV program and it ran for weeks and months uh, in an absolutely determined drive to discredit the leaders uh, of the strike. Now, all the allegations were shown very quickly to be entirely false. In relation to the home loans, the only person about whom it was true uh, was one of those who had been paid to make the allegations, the chief executive uh, of the NUM during the miners' strike, uh, Roger Windsor. But in the process of that campaign and the effort to turn back the smear, camp the smear allegations, the NUM leadership were obliged to reveal exactly how they had beaten the sequestration and receivership drive, which, the, which Penny was re referring to, whereby the NUM as an organisation during the strike was actually taken over by the courts and the real NUM had to run as a kind of outlaw organisation on cash alone. And in that process, by having to reveal that, they triggered a whole series of legal actions and prosecutions which tied up the union in a crucial period in the run-up to the final effort to drive through pit closures and, co and close the bulk uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the coal industry. And that was how it was in trying to unpick those allegations and that smear campaign that I got involved in the beginning of what became uh, this book. Because in the process of trying to do that, uh, I and others at The Guardian came across one leak and revelation from inside the state after another. That in fact this campaign of smear allegations against the strike leaders had been inspired in the heart of the state and in the secret state. That it started out with leaks from GCHQ, the GCHQ and NSA station in Mormonstow in Cornwall, which still exists today and is part of the gigantic uh, NSA GCHQ operation of today. They, they told us how during the strike and afterwards the Surveillance, this electronic surveillance system had been used to target the miners' union, the miners' leaders, and how they were trying to evade sequestration and receivership. They told us about how dirty tricks had been used to make phony cash deposits in accounts linked to the NUM uh, leadership, how the security services had been directly involved in the press and media campaign uh, to discredit the NUM leadership. Then after that, Arising from the same process, we were told and had a string of allegations about the role of MI5. In particular, the then head of MI5, Stella Remington, and her role in the strike and in the efforts to beat the strike in 1984-5. And, and then we were told about MI5 links with David Hart. Some of you, I'm sure, will remember David Hart was a kind of obscure right-wing financier who was very close to Thatcher, who worked behind the scenes during the strike to finance and organize the Back to Work campaign and to, crucially, finance and organize the legal actions that led to sequestration uh, and receivership. We were told about the infiltration of agents into the NUM by MI5 and Special Branch at all levels, but including at the highest level of the union. Of the union. And it culminated in the naming of Roger Windsor as an MI5 agent who had been sent in to de destabilize the NUM in Parliament. Uh, uh, interestingly, I should just say that he continues to deny that. Uh, and he, Roger Windsor had been involved in the most uh, damaging media episode during the strike when he was photographed embracing Colonel Gaddafi in Tripoli in <coughs> Libya on TV. Uh, he was, of course, involved in the smear campaign of 1990 against the UNUM leaders. He was involved in a string of internal conflicts and mistakes in the Union. And he was finally being shown by the courts in France and in Britain to have been directly involved in forgery uh, in attempts to discredit and the, the NUM leaders and to avoid uh, paying his own um, debts. Now, one of the things that was gratis gratifying about reporting all this and then the first time when we published The Enemy Within in the 1990s 
was that the media, which had previously gone hell for leather behind these corruption allegations, almost uh, without uh, exception, suddenly exercised a dramatic retreat and fallback. They said, of course, the corruption allegations had been entirely uh, without foundation, and of course they'd been disproved, disproved, that's perfectly true. But all this stuff about the security services and MI5, that was um, unproven, and it was dependent on anonymous sources, which really uh, couldn't be accepted. But of course, since then, uh, Stella Remington herself, in her memoirs, which led to a big battle with the head of MI5 after she left, um, were published, acknowledging her central role uh, in the operations against the strike. Uh, MI5's own authorised history talks about it in some detail, though how seriously you can take some of the points in that, I leave to your imagination. David Shaler, another MI5 de uh, defector, uh, confirmed that there was an agent in the NUM national office. A string of spe former special branch commanders gave evidence in public about how they had had probably another agent high up in the NUM who gave them crucial information about uh, picketing so that the police could manoeuvre against the picketing uh, operation. These people identified that agent as uh, under the code name Silver Fox. And they even uh, claimed that the former right-wing leader of the NUM before Scargill was uh, president, Joe Gormley, had in fact been a special <coughs> branch agent working secretly uh, for the state. And the most recent documents that have been released by the government, uh, cabinet office documents, confirm uh, that the MI5 operation began in relation to the miners, was ratcheted up before the strike. The level of surveillance was at an incredibly high intensity, including everything to do with the relationships, drinking habits of all the NUM officials at, at all levels of the organisation. Because they identified anyone who they de determined to be a subversive as a potential and legitimate target, you know, they, they identified themselves at that time. There were a thousand Communist Party members in the NUM, so they were all legitimate uh, targets, ag ag along with a whole string of other uh, left-wing um, activists. And uh, they also talk about, in, the, in these documents, directly leaking an information to the press in a way to discredit the strike leaders or the NUM leaders. Now, I think there's no doubt that th this secret state operation had an impact on the strike and perhaps even more on the aftermath uh, of the strike as the miners and their leadership struggle to deal with the impact of these unprecedented uh, legal operations against them, the attempts to divide and split the union, uh, the uh, legal actions that were brought against them. So, as I said, David Hart brought a string of legal actions and was involved in those cases. We now know he was directly working uh, with MI5. It had an impact on the internal uh, politics of the union, uh, on its public image, on the legal actions, on the picketing effort, as I've said, uh, and the attempt to move or to... to um, uh, to black stockpiles of coal. But of course, the secret operations against the strike were only the counterpoint, counterpart of the open panoply of state coercion with the police centre stage that Penny um, was talking about, the mass arrests, the mass sackings and jailings, the roadblocks that prevented people moving around the country, um, the fit-ups of miners and other activists in picketing confrontations, notably at Orgreave, the false prosecutions which subsequently um, collapsed. And of course, all that depended in turn on the divisions in the labor movement that prevented the full solidarity that was needed uh, for the strike. The position of the, of the Labour Party leadership, which was effectively hostile to the strike, the media campaign, relentlessly hostile uh, to the NUM and its leadership uh, and the miners over 30 years, and the divisions on the ground, crucially, among miners, and most importantly in Nottinghamshire, uh, but in other parts of the Midlands as well. So the secret state operation against the strike was not the determinant of its outcome, of course, but it was one factor which has been heavily um, underplayed. Um, 
Now, we're in a different world now, obviously, from 30 years ago. Uh, the labor movement and the left are much weaker than they were in 1984, partly as a result of the outcome of the strike. The security service uh, no longer supposedly targets subversives. But one of the things that is striking about uh, what's happened since and what's been revealed in the last few years in particular is how the secret state has swelled and grown in the period since the miners' strike at an enormous rate. MI5 is now almost triple the size it was then, of course, heavily target targeting Muslim activists uh, and Islamist groups. Uh, GCHQ and NSA, which played an absolutely crucial role in the secret operations against the NUM, it has expanded at, at an absolutely gigantic level, and there's been many revelations about that, of course, in the last, uh, in the last year. Uh, the special branch and the police and police uh, counter-subversion operations and units are now targeted against so-called extremists, uh, and we've seen a string of them exposed, uh, e even in the last few days, for the infiltration of undercover agents throughout uh, campaigning and protest groups. They're really very similar to what happened to the NUM and, of course, against the Stephen Lawrence family, anti-racist anti campaigns, environmentalists, uh, animal rights groups. Uh, and again, the dirty tricks and the agent provocateur operations are once again in play. I mean, famously, the McLeibel uh, leaflet against McDonald's was actually drafted by an undercover um, police officer. And uh, we've also seen, at a time when trade unionism is supposed to be so uh, unimportant and unthreatening, the revelations of mass blacklisting uh, against trade union activists and political activists in the trade union movement, uh, which once again is hand in glove between the state and the corporate sector. Now, 30 years on, the coal industry is, of course, a shadow of its former self. Uh, we're, the issue of coal is tied up with climate change and global warming. The NUM is, what's left of it is, of course, tiny and very weak. The mining communities uh, were devastated and to continue to show the scars of that experience of the closure of their industry. Um, and they've lived with, as we all have, with the imp impact of the neoliberal corporate-led transformation of Britain, uh, which has now not only driven up inequality and led to the most intense economic crisis, uh, but has been seen to fail uh, in the crisis that we're living through. Now, the, if the NUM had been victorious in 1984-5, it wouldn't have been able to turn that neoliberal tide back on its own. That's a global phenomenon, of course. But I think it would have, at the very least, weakened the Thatcher government, possibly fatally, uh, it would have at least reined in the worst excesses of that neoliberal experience in Britain, and it would have put a break on the uh, drive in the Labour Party to go to the New Labour third way uh, model. And actually, by the way, in relation to global warming, there would have been far greater investment in clean coal technology uh, and uh, carbon capture and storage because Britain at that time, the nationalised coal industry, was at the cutting edge globally of that, um, of that investment and that uh, research. Now, there are many lessons to draw from the dispute, of course, but I just want to draw attention to two or three which I think might be useful uh, for the future. I mean, in the end, the miners' strike of 84-5 was not really about fuel or the coal industry, it was about cl class and social power. And it's now clearer than it even was at the time that it's only through building a social and political counterweight that, that class, but those kind of class battles uh, can be won, that they can't obviously be won uh, with trade union uh, organization uh, alone. And we need to be looking for new forms uh, to contest that corporate power that we're living under today and the neoliberal model uh, that it's uh, overseen. The second point is, I think, that uh, when 
class interests and state interests in terms of who controls the state are threatened as seriously as the challenge that threatened uh, the Thatcher government uh, in the form of the NUM and uh, under its then leadership in such a serious way. They don't play by the Queensbury rules. Uh, they change the rules as it suits them. And in fact, one of the things that happened in the miners' strike, that all sorts of legal precedents and judgments were rearranged by the courts to rig the system against the miners and their leadership. And they all had to be then untangled after the strike and after the sequestration and rece receivership ended because it was causing all pro sorts of problems for private companies and interests because they'd had to rewrite the rules. So they'll rewrite the rules. And we have to recognize that uh, in the way we respond when there are serious uh, clashes of that kind. And the, the last point really is that you can't always fight on the territory uh, or at the time you want to. Um, and I think one of the things that, that happened in the case of the miners and their leadership is that people didn't give the NUM leadership the benefit of the doubt when they had the right to expect it uh, over, for example, the campaign of corruption allegations, which are still sometimes being uh, dredged up today. And I think that's something we need to do. And of course, the final point is that divisions in both industrial and political struggles against such powerful enemies um, are fatal. But nevertheless, I think uh, a generation on, the miners' stand has clearly been vindicated in everything that's happened since. Um, the Thatcher record and everything that flowed from it has been discredited and has, is being discredited in the world we're living through today. And clearly, the strike of 84-5 remains an inspiration an example of endurance and collective solidarity without parallel in, uh, in modern times and is a lesson and inspiration for the struggles of the future. Thanks very much.